Welcome to the Evolve Move Play podcast, where we bring you the most interesting and enlightening conversations around movement practice and how you can become the most heroic version of yourself through pursuing movement that's relevant to your nature. This is a podcast that's going to feature some of the top movers in the world, some of the most amazing movement thinkers, and people from fields that are related to movement as far afield as evolutionary theory, strength and conditioning, and everything in between. So if you're interested in movement, Please stick around, and if you like our work and want to support it, please consider supporting us on Patreon because this podcast is completely listener-supported. We don't want to take any advertising. We don't want to interrupt your experience of watching the show. So what really helps us get the best thinkers on, have the time to put these together, have the best quality for you guys as far as audio and video is your support. So please consider supporting us and enjoy the rest of the show. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Evolve Move Play podcast. This week, my guest is Joel Smith. Joel Smith is himself a podcaster. He runs a podcast called Just Fly Performance. Um, and he also is an author of a book called Speed Strength. And he's formerly a collegiate strength performance coach for tennis, track and field, and swimming at the University of California, Berkeley, as well as a uh, former track and field coach and now working in the private sector. So. Joel brings together a wealth of influences. His podcast is, you know, one of the really central podcasts in this kind of arena of where strength conditioning meets sports performance and track and field. And he's brought in some of the best speakers. I've gotten, you know, super into lots of people for listening to his podcast. And he's synthesized those influences for a really unique take on how we improve athletic performance. And so this is a very fun conversation going deep into that side of what Evolve Move Play does, which is fun because the last few weeks have been very focused on the meaning side of what we do. And, you know, that's wonderful, but it's also nice to get back to the brass tacks of, of how we help athletes improve the movement. For us, having that as a foundation really helps ground everything that we do. And this is a really fun conversation where we look a lot at the language that we use, the way that we drill, and how we design practices that can optimally help athletes become adaptable, elastic, and competent movers. So without further ado, Joel Smith. Joel, welcome to the Evolve Move Play podcast. I'm really excited to have this conversation with you. Rafe, it's awesome to be chatting with you today. Cool. So let's talk a little bit about your background for folks who don't know you. So you have a podcast called the Just Like Performance Podcast. You have a background in doing strength and conditioning training or strength performance, whatever we call it these days, um, for a variety of different collegiate teams, right? You were doing tennis, swimming. What other teams have you worked with? Yeah, uh, tennis, swim, track, water polo were uh, when my time as a full-time college strength coach, that was it. And it was very a, a big contrast versus I was a full-time track coach before that for six years. Okay, so you did just track coaching for six years. And then as an athlete, you, uh, did you, uh, you ran track in college, right? Yeah. High school, um, basketball and track in high school. Uh, and then eventually track became, uh, my, my main thing. I just, we can talk about why I was not good at basketball. I I'm starting to learn more and more about why I was not good at that. I mean, yeah. it wasn't bad, like, but track became my thing. And so high jump, triple jump, javelin ran a little bit of hurdles. So I think hurdles probably maybe being one of the closer things to parkour elements. And yeah, um, yeah so I did that and a little bit in my twenties, I still do occasionally now, but um, I, I would like to get back into master's track, but I may wait till I'm 40. Cause then I'm like, you know, eight, you age up and then you're against all the other 40 year olds and stuff. So yeah, yeah for sure. I'm, I'm 39. So, uh, so yeah, next year I'm going go in there and start smashing people. <laughs> Sorry for the reminder. If I guess that's, a, it's interesting to think about. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So, so you've been doing that for, for many years and you've gone through quite a few different iterations of ways to look at things. And you wrote a book called, um, speed strength. I believe. Yeah. That's the most recent one, probably the best one of my three. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. So, I've been reading through your post recently and obviously I'm a big fan of your podcast. I love listening to your podcast. I think you have some of the best guests and just really interesting uh, discussions on the podcast. And one of the posts that kind of intrigued me as an interesting starting grounds for this conversation is what do you, why do you think that um, strengthening performance coaches should probably focus more on feminine strategies for the development of athletes over time? Can you talk about what that means to you and, and why you think that's the case? Yeah, for sure. And 
Uh, that's been a big, I guess you could call it a passion of mine, but more just like you notice the gap in the field. And it's funny, like words, you know, words matter. And to some people, they hear feminine and they, I don't think to me, you could say yin and yang or, or more of like yin strategies or softer strategies. I think that some people will hear feminine in, in physical training and think a particular thing about it. Um, mm -hmm. But to me, the strength and conditioning industry, having gone through coaching and coaching education, um, you'll see, and I was actually just talking with a coach from, um, I think the UK about this today. I, I know you just had Paul check on your podcast and he had a recent episode with the Alexander technique. And that's another, you know, one of those softer things. And so uh, I was just chatting with him a little bit about um, like, like that softer side, but you see in coaching, like in track, especially it's the, the words used are often like punch, push. Um, it's the verbiage would almost indicate that we're at war with something, you know, like you're at war with the track, smack it, you know, push it. Um, and versus a harmony, like, and I think I learned the most about that harmony that exists. And this was such a blessing for me to work with swimming because when I started working with swimming, eight years ago about, I mean, I didn't even know what the fastest, I, I knew what the fastest, I didn't even know what the slowest stroke was. I didn't even know that breaststroke stroke was the slowest stroke of the four. I, I was here, I am talking to a guy on the USA, like biomechanics and swimming. And he's like teaching me from a fifth grade level about all this stuff. But as I went, moved through it, I, I was able to work with some really good coaches who talked about not fighting the water. And that was almost the first place I, I, as well as working with the Darien bar. But that those swim coaches were the first place where I really learned like about the symbiosis of working with your environment. You're working with the, the ground, you're working with the force, the ground gives back up into your body. Every time you would just, if you just punch the ground, if I'm sprinting, I'm going to create a vibrational mismatch. So uh, to me, the, the feminine is really, it's the timing. It's learning to work with, it's making things more efficient. And I think that people who already have it from like their balance, they, their environment was good growing up, their belief system and the way they move is good. You can give them more masculine training, like just the speed, the power, the compression, and they'll succeed. But you start to notice that when those, um, the masculine is an imbalance, you get too much compression. You, um, you almost have to be stronger than you need to be to succeed. And that's what a Darian will talk about. So uh, to me, it's not just, it is a coaching thing. I think it's kind of, you know, Carl Jung talked about, it could be like a society thing too. I mean, that's my knowledge base there is less, so I'm not going to go into that a ton, but I think that generally speaking, uh, just getting into a more holistic um, mindset when we approach clients and the way we wor work and move with our environment. Okay. So I'm just trying to map this to my context, right? So I've been uh, just starting actually to teach at a MMA gym, right? So it's kind of fun. I've, I've been doing martial arts since I was six years old and, and you know, uh, haven't had a, a gym to work with. So I would go in and start training with the athletes and it's pretty clear, you know, my level is very high. And what I understand about coaching is translating really well in this environment. So I go right into the kind of coaching and I'm noticing like, so I'm, I'm wrestling with somebody. We're doing a, a technique called the Kimura. So someone's reached through my arm and, and is, has a two-on-one control of my, of my wrist trying to torque my, my shoulder, okay? And what I, what I, they, they think I'm strong, right? And I am strong, but that's not really what's happening so much. It's more that I have really high sensitivity to where the pressure is coming from and I can just feel where there's a gap in their pressure and drive my arm into it. It's like, if you give me any room, I can find it. And what I'm recognizing in the athletes that I'm working with is that they can't find the room or they can't, they don't have high motor sensitivity of the area. So when I'm, when I'm on top of a guy doing jujitsu, like I can create pressure on his body by having very good awareness of where my weight is relative to his and of feeling how his body's shifting through the kinetic feedback from my chest and my shoulders, right? And all of that is essentially, um, it's not particularly reliant on strength, right? And, and I, could, I could say, okay, this athlete is having a hard time getting their arm free when you put a Kimura on them. So let's make them stronger. And right? we'll do some bench press, we'll do some pull-ups, blah, blah, blah. But in that context, especially actually, like 
sensitivity is way more powerful than strength. And that's why jujitsu, I mean, jujitsu means the art of gentleness. That's the, that's the original meaning, right? But we're always trying to balance these two things as coaches, right? We have to develop the physical qualities that allow an athlete to succeed. And then we also have to develop these sensitivities. So I'm thinking about that now in, in the context that you're coming from and thinking about, you know, I talked to you on, on your podcast last week and we're talking about the, the, the sense of rhythm of where force is applied on the, on the ground, right? So when you're, when you're working with an athlete and they're sprinting, and we're talking about how that foot hits the ground. So you talk about the, 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 um, the cue of push or the cue of pull. And what do those communicate to the athlete? And why might you use one versus the other? Yeah, that's the push pull is a really good topic. And I'll try to relate it and make it um, gen general inferences as much as I can without getting too, I guess, in the weeds of being track specific. I will say too, track is a sport where athletes can have a lot of success despite maybe being over cued in some of these things. Cause what you'll often see and you get coaches kind of, I would say quote unquote complain about this a lot is they're like, Oh, I, I coached the athlete so technically good. And then when they actually went and ran their 40 at the combine, you know, or they went to compete maximally, they, they didn't do the technique we worked on. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of times the body is extremely intelligent and it's just going to do what it takes to be the fastest on that day. You know what I'm saying? Like it happens all the time. And that's been credit to Darian Barr for teaching me these things. Cause I think he's one of the few people who really sees things that way. Um, but I do view pulling, uh, as a little bit more, yeah, yin, a feminine, um, because pulling when you pull, like if I'm running and I'm, I'm, I'm doing a, or accelerating and I'm pulling myself forward, um, it's almost, I think it helps me to time up with gravity like that, that works with the fall, if that makes sense. So as I, my center of mass starts to fall over the foot on the ground, the pull, I think allows me to work with that versus a push is a little bit more. I mean, you can make it an external cue, meaning, um, something outside of yourself, which has been yeah. proven to be push the ground. Most that, yeah. yeah. You could, you could spin it and make it that. And, and I've talked with football coaches about this and sometimes it does work. Um, saying push the ground away, um, a push cue. And from what I've gathered in that conversation, this is just my take. Again, I'm going to be biased because, I mean, just for me, I have to look at myself and my event area. A lot of athletes I train are elastic. We're pullers by nature. Um, and so like at, athletes are either basically kangaroos or gorillas for the most part, if you want to take it that way. And so a kangaroo, a bouncing elastic athlete like myself, better at deadlift. You mentioned being better at deadlift Ed, when on the podcast we did recently okay. and how that kind of changed you, at least, you know, until you started doing more squats. Um, those athletes are naturally designed to pull versus a pusher, a gorilla, someone who is naturally a little bit better at squatting has more muscle on them, which a lot of football players are. And again, mm -hmm. the weight room does change your structure over time. Like if you're in the squat rack for long enough, your, your human structure will physically change, meaning your infrasternal angle of the rib cage will actually widen out to become more of an inhaled position. Um, and so you are changing your structure. So if someone's been squatting for eight years or something, and they have a lot of muscle anyways, the push cue may work better for them in that time space, because that's their language. <laughs> that's what they identify with. Like they identify with pushing. The question is, is does that mean it's optimal? Um, so, and, and the, also the question would be, well, what strategy might they exhibit um, when the context is not just sprint ahead 10 to 40 yards as fast as you can? What about when the context is here's a player and I have to run to them, right? I have to run to a ball. Um, how does the body organize that? I, I think that sometimes when it's just you and the environment and it's a flat, very sterile environment and it's do something, I think that can almost be a different cue set than something that's very alive and dynamic. You have different trees and different levels or players and things coming at you. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to bring this around. So some athletes are more suited. Elastic kangaroos are going to be always, for the most part, better receptive to um, pulling cues. Gorillas may do better with pushing cues, but the question then becomes, was well, the gorillas the optimal way we we're supposed to work? You know what I'm saying? Like, Aren't we supposed to be more elastic? And so I think that where I'm headed is I, I believe that the elastic path is the more resilient and robust path. And I will say like, 
if you took those gorillas who use the push cue, the question then is, well, how did you get faster if someone told you to push the ground away? A lot of times when you see athletes, and I'll watch athletes, and I learned this from the swim coaches I worked with, is watch an athlete and try to notice where their intention is. Like watch them walk, watch them jump. Try to see where they're mentally directing their intention before you even talk to them, if that makes sense. And that's almost the first thing. So sometimes you can see athletes who are accelerating, for example, and you know they're thinking of pushing the ground away because you watch their foot and Achilles pushing back into the ground. And you can see that heel getting really pressed down towards the ground while they're pushing. But mm. what that's doing or what it can do is actually overstretches the Achilles. So, or their foot is going into too much dorsiflexion. So they're like consciously pushing the leg back, which is causing the force, the heavy force coming down from the quads and glutes. But now the Achilles is getting stretched really fast. And by the time they finally take off, the Achilles actually is not timing up its release with the rest of the body. So then the question is, well, if they run faster, how could they run faster? <laughs> I think then you have to get into like a case by case analysis. Um, so I'll, I'll say this, I think in theory, I want athletes to be more elastic in practice. Sometimes more muscle driven athletes can work better with those cues. I'm not sure that I believe that would be optimal. My goal, if I, you know, for those athletes, even been working with those athletes, I don't use those cues. I try to use more external type things to get them to that place. Cause I kind of want to shift their language ideally. There's a bunch of stuff you kicked over there. I think would be really interesting to, to dig deep into. So um, I want to go back to my own background a little bit. So I, I came up through parkour, right? Uh, I was a martial artist and then I did gymnastics recreationally and I played basketball recreationally, but was never involved in the, in the, the teams because I was homeschooled and I went to college when I was 16 and stuff. So I was outside of the kind of general sort of trajectory of, of strength and conditioning in a way um, and team sport. And I, I started getting interested in like, how do I run better when I was, uh, was training uh, parkour in the early days and really getting interested in method natural as well. And so uh, I ran into an older French method. I think it was the Petri method that talked about like the, the cycle where the legs are in front of the, of the body versus the cycle where the legs are behind the body, right? Cycle of all, cycle all right, I think or something like that. And then, um, and then through CrossFit, I was exposed to pose running, right? And pose running talks a lot about the idea of pull, right? The gravity is the primary engine of running. And so we wanna, we wanna essentially not be resisting gravity too much. We wanna be aligning ourselves with gravity and then getting that pull to happen. And my initial forays into teaching people to run through pose were a complete disaster, to be honest, right? Like uh, there was way too much cueing, way too much drilling, you know? And mostly people's gait would just get really disorganized because you're trying to change something that has, um, you know, you have millions of repetitions of this pattern. And then you try to like get people to, to do something really specific with their hamstring at a specific phase in, in, the, in the gait cycle. And it's just gonna disorganize the whole thing. But I was able to do it and get better it felt like I became a more efficient runner through the pose cues and through learning it. And I became a four foot runner and I was pretty heel, heel bound before that. And then I went and trained with uh, Mike Cunliffe from Seattle Speed, his daughter, Hannah Cunliffe, you know, six time national champion. And he, he was coaching push, right? Push the ground, push the ground. Like when you're, when you're, especially in that max velocity phase, you're trying to put, uh, or sorry, push in the acceleration phase. And then you're popping the ground when you're in the max velocity phase, trying to get that high, tall running posture. And that worked for me too, right? I, I, I went from probably like a 13 and a half hundred to like around a 1200 uh, over 11 weeks of training with Mike. And um, what I realized is that what he was describing with push was really pretty closely aligned to what the pose people were describing with pull. They're both about getting the foot in the right relationship with the center of mass when it was hitting the ground. That was what it felt like to me. So you're using two different, two opposing languages to describe the same phenomenon once you actually break down what the, what that cue is actually supposed to mean. Um, so I think that you, it's just an interesting thing of like, how do we, how are we coding these cues and how, and what is it communicating to the athletes? Um, 
I was talking about this yesterday. I was teaching a group of gymnastics coaches about, uh, about coaching. And I was talking about how like when you pick a cue, like push or pull, you're calling forth everything that's associated with that word in that person's brain, right? And it can kind of get more and more finely honed to the specific thing that you're looking for within sport. But uh, you have to kind of work with the athlete on, on realizing the specific qualities that you're trying to bring forth with a cue like that. So I'm curious what your, what your, your take is on, on, on that. Like how, for me, it looks like you can do it either way, right? But there's a context to the way in which the cue is used that that's important. Another aspect that you picked up on there that I think is really important is that the athlete self-regulates, right? Like when they have to, when you tell them to run fast, they forget this, all the other stuff and run fast. And oftentimes that's the best way to get them to do something. So I have a quick, just follow up with what you said that to try to tie that up. Um, Cause I, I agree. That's why I wanted to say, look, like I don't, to, to totally polarize it and say, look, man, like if you're using push cues, no one's going to run. Cause people do like, I guess I'm just always trying to find why and how, um, I mean, to me, again, the optimal is this elastic paradigm uh, from a base of robustness and resiliency and, and maybe your maximal ceiling. And John Kiley, who was on my podcast a long time ago, a really brilliant guy from Ireland. I think he worked with like Japan's rugby world cup and, he's done a lot of periodization, but he's done a lot of stuff just on like the human engine and human evolution. And I remember he wrote a really good article that intrigued me, I think to the point where I, that was one of the things that wanted me or led me to get him on my show. But basically a person who was like missing their whole calf and still figured out the muscle at least, and still figured out a way to run a marathon at like a very high level and how we adapt and how we, we even adapt to run. And when I asked him about internal and external cues and he said, and, and I, I like um, Nick Winkleman's book. Um, uh, oh, I, I don't know why it's, I, I know the, the language of coaching. I've got yeah, it on like, my wall. It's sitting, yeah, it's sitting in my library right now. And he shows some really cool charts of basically like what happened when groups were cued externally, what happened when they were cued internally over time. And it's almost like, uh, it's interesting to see that the, the internal cues just screw people up instantly and st things like that. And then they'll come back once you lay off the cues, though, like you start, you stop putting their head. It's almost like the body can be figured out. But John Kiley said internal cues can work if it allows an athlete just to put awareness there. It's almost mm -hmm. like if the athlete just if I say to a runner, do X, Y, Z with your arms and they aren't really doing that with their arms. They're just thinking about their arms and playing around a little bit maybe they figured it out on their own and it actually wasn't because they did what I t told them to, to a T. In fact, I find that athletes in my experience who are going to do that, um, you could say they're just more, um, if you get in the, the neurotyping rabbit hole, Kristen Thibodeau called them a type three, extremely technically minded folk. So let's say that way, who are expecting a coach to tell them how to do something. They're actually going to be worse technicians in terms of that yin yang balance the fluidity in my experience than people who are just more all right coach you know tell me something i'll mess around with it you know i'll figure it out on my own almost type person because those people as long as you can steer them correctly i think there's a little more balance there and so with the like with the push even like perhaps like you were saying like i sometimes i think our cues and instructions can work with an athlete on a level different than intended or perhaps there's a shared principle like you said that might um come out. And I think a lot of times, especially track and field athletes will set a world leading or world record performance and people, there's a weird technique going on that people didn't coach. Um, some, it's just their own way of expressing it. So sometimes I, I think it's the more we know about human movement, the more we can actually see what an athlete did with a cue. And I'm always pretty mindful. I've been done this with myself of like made a chart. Okay. I'm going to do accelerations. And I would write Here's the cue I use. Here's the time I ran. Okay. Here's the cue I use. Here's the time I ran. And just try to notice again, for me, without question, pulling cues will do, I will run much faster, <laughs> but I think it's, it's a little bit individual. And then I think that just being mindful of your paradigm over time, because if everything's pushing, then everything is inherently going to be a little more muscular, unless those push cues are creating something else in the chain that's beneficial to happen. So I hope I tied that up somewhat well. Yeah, yeah. I think I wanted to talk. I wanted to go back to the the self organization idea for a second because um, I think that's interesting. I'm certainly the type of person who's highly analytical, and I feel like that's been uh, limiting for me as an athlete, right? Because I'm 
I, I almost take on too much when given information and I try to control the information too much in my mind. Whereas the ability to, 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 uh, to cultivate feel is different than the ability to think about something correctly. Um, and, uh, Nick actually talks about this as well. He talks about the idea that like there's a difference between uh, an internal focus of attention um, that is that brings awareness to something versus an internal cue, right? So he, he likes, for instance, saying like, generally he would prefer to do it, if I remember correctly what he told me, he would prefer to do it after a rep rather than before a rep. But if you have someone say sprinting and you think that, you know, their, their glutes are not participating the way that you would want them to telling them to fire their glutes will get them to fire their glutes more, but it will disharmonize the rest of the movement pattern. However, if you work with that same sprinter and you ask them to, to, to the question, how, how are your glutes working in that last rep? that will tend to allow them to learn to gain awareness of that aspect of their body without disrupting the organization of the pattern in other ways. Um, and that seems like it's aligned with what you were, what you were talking about as far as how we can do this. Yeah, that's what uh, Timothy um, Galloway in the inner game of tennis, that's where I, if you look at what I oftentimes will, will instruct athletes, which I always will err on the side of less is I, that's probably the primary instruction I'll try to use is something, notice something, just, just notice it. Don't, I'm not even telling you what to do with it. It's like, I almost want to do that first before I even tell them what the right technique is to see if they can, to give them a chance to figure it out on their own. And, and I almost don't even want to put in their head, like a position. Um, I've worked with really elite coaches who don't even coach positions. Actually, they want you to find the bandwidth of whatever the right position is. You should be without actually trying to get there. Cause I believe when you try to get there, you actually create unnecessary co-contractions mm -hmm. and you disharmonize the potential fluidity and reactivity of what you're doing. Like, I mean, knees up and running would be the most common probably example of that. Cause that doesn't work for anybody to run faster. I mean, I was joking. I was making, leaving some comments on a Darian bars, um, Instagram. He posted the NCAA indoor track and field championships for this past weekend. And I always, you know, that's like, Christmas, you know, for, you know, biomechanist people like me and Adarian and the winner of the 60 meter dash. So a six second, six second race, the guy who won had the lowest knees in the whole group. And the funny thing is he didn't even start that well. He overtook everyone running with lower knees than everybody else. And yet you're still going to get people saying, Oh man, that guy just lifted his knees more. Well, he would be even better. And it's like, no, that's why you don't understand. This is why this guy is better. Um, I, I got so uh, carried away with that. I actually don't remember. Man, I don't even remember exactly what I was talking about. Oh, the notice thing. But sorry, I'll, I'll bring it back. Um, like, but just I can say for me personally, uh, what I when I'm running like a 20 or a 30, uh, my best system that works best for me is actually zero to 10. Notice my feet. Like, notice my feet. Notice my transverse arch, which is like the balls of the feet. Just notice that, and don't think about anything else. Just pay attention. Be a passive observer, and that almost allows me to create the positions that I need to without thinking about them. And then from 10 to like 20, it might be just notice your hips. Now, what are your hips doing? And so I, I've almost, I have like this notice based library and I love Nick's analogies too, between like the notice and the analogies, see if that creates the position you want before you even put it in the athlete's head. Hey, you gotta be right here. You know what I'm saying? Like, cause then it might be over analysis, too many co-contractions and they have almost that you could even take it to, well, a, ch a child, like, do you want, I mean, I, my kids are up are you know, school age now. And it's kind of like this idea of, oh, here they go, like hyper, you know, they're, they're young and everything is like X, Y, Z and less room for creativity, right. As opposed to like Rudolf Steiner type method or something like that. And I do feel if that it's almost like if you stifle the creative brain before it's fully developed, even on the level of a child, the level of a movement, whatever, you kind of sealing that person, uh, in my opinion, technically. So that's all I have yeah. to say about that. It's <laughs> interesting. Uh, I uh, so so yesterday I I used to work for a gymnastics gym. One of my first jobs in the movement industry was for a gymnastics gym here in Bellingham. I just moved back to town, 
And so I went to them and, you know, had a chat with them about doing some work with them and my kids get memberships there now. And so, um, so today my son will go and do the parkour class with them. But, uh, and my, my youngest daughter will be doing the, the kindergarten, kinder, kinder gym program. And my older daughter will be the school age program tomorrow. So, so anyways, I, uh, but I, I'm, I'm lucky because I get to go and influence their coaches to coach the way that I, that I want, that I want it to be. So I went up there and, 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 you know, taught them about cues and about constraints and about, you know, like respecting the athlete's self-organization, all the stuff. And afterwards I was playing around and I've been working on uh, my front flip, right? So, so in, in parkour, there's, or in, you know, so there's a few different ways that you can front flip, right? But you could punch with two feet you can split your legs and kick your back leg up and use your back leg to create a rotation. Or you can take off with two legs, basically very similarly to the type of two foot takeoff you see going up for a dunk in basketball, right? Now with the front flip or a Kong ball in parkour, uh, that's not, that's a symmetrical, uh, it's some, um, you don't have the foot turn in, right? So when you do, uh, the block and, 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 uh, What's the terminology for that? I can't remember what they use, but you have your penultimate step you, or that last step that hits the ground and then the step that comes around, right? And that blocks you up. Um, yeah. That tends to be asymmetrical, right? You, yes. you have your feet twisted. You now, when you're going straight forward, uh, you're trying to go horizontally for uh, a, a um, uh, for parkour or for a, for a vault or a flip, you want your feet basically aligned directly forward, right? So your feet are pointing forward, but uh, the other aspects of the strategy are basically very, very similar. So I've noticed in my, so I have a problem where my body wants to kick the back leg up rather than drive up off the two feet, which isn't supporting my goals because I want to be able to go high. And the back leg kick is very efficient for getting rotation, but it prevents you from getting a lot of height. So playing with constraints, I've been able to fix this by putting a barrier in front of me and then flipping into the pit where it's nice and soft. And so, I, you know, I have less anxiety and now with the right constraint, all of a sudden it's starting to organize. But what I noticed when I watched my video versus uh, some of the athletes I'm working with is that I, I'm jumping too high. So I'm coming, uh, instead of kind of coming down and falling into that penultimate step, I'm going up a lot. And then when I land on that second to last step, um, my body's already past the, fur, uh, the foot. So I'm, I'm avoiding that collision of that first leg on the ground in some sense. So, you know, we can use augmented feedback. I can watch a video of myself do that. And then I can try to cue myself. Um, and yesterday there was, I was flipping over a vault block and and there was just a subtle thing that happened where I tucked my shoulder slightly. So instead of going straight over, like, like a classic front flip, I just did the slightest bit of this. And all of a sudden it was like the whole thing felt different. And there was this sense of, of easy dropping into the takeoff. And then this pop pop as my feet hit the ground and the height just came up. Right. And it was like, okay, that's, that's just a feel, right? Like now I need to, to feel and remember that feel. And so I, I didn't take video or anything. I just tried to remember the feel and keep the feel. And that ability to have sensitivity to those small changes. I think that's such a critical aspect of what actually allows athletes to progress over time. And if we load them down with too much thinkiness, um, I think that's that that actually gets in the way of the attunement to what's happening at the feel level of the organism. So I'm curious. Uh, I mean, I think that that aligns with what you're saying there. I'm curious if uh, if you have any anything to uh, sort of add to that that ramble. Yeah, no, that's really good, and I I love how you mentioned that. And it, I will say, like my my coaching tends to almost look look more like like I always am bringing my cones. My Adarian's um, Adarian has little foot cutout trainers, basically different. Um, like you'll, it's like you could put in your insole of your shoe with different pressure points, essentially. But these are meant to sit on the flat ground, and you put your foot on them, and it might like pop your transverse arch up. It might do different things with, or sorry, the, like the the middle ball of your foot. It might pop that up a little bit to force you to have a more like you know, domey arch to support alpha, things like that. So uh, my coaching is 
I, I actually, I was working with one of the first athletes I started working with when I got to the gym I'm at now, um, Evo Fit here in Cincinnati was a football lineman who had been like all football linemen, basically overlifted and they're forced to, they, they are expected to lift a certain amount of weight and, you know, and, and it, I mean, to an extent, I mean, Eric Corum, who's, uh, worked uh, in the NFL and as a high performance, I think at, at Kentucky has said that if you're a football lineman, the 225 bench for reps is one of the biggest KPIs of what you do or key performance indicators. You need to be strong, but at the same time, you're going to probably trade that for movement quality a lot of times. So long story short is we, okay, those guys don't run fast, but we are interested in the 10 and the 20. Okay. Especially the 10 and this particular lineman, we took two tenths off of his 10, which is a massive, uh, that's massive. Okay. In about, I want to say four or five weeks. And the primary thing we did, like if we really, there's a few things we, we would always warm up with different uh, awareness points of the feet. Uh, Mike Kozak, who's a, colleague of mine up in Columbus, um, he always starts with this too, but basically different foot surfaces, interacting, sensing, and noticing your feet different ways. And then the main drill we did was basically a drill where he would be standing for a start with one foot on the Adarian's um, little foot sensor. I mean, honestly, you don't even need that. You could just put a nickel under the the third, the middle toe, just the ball, the that just put like a nickel behind it. You can do that too. Um, but we would, I would put the foot pressure down. He would then have a bench behind him, maybe 18 inches, and have his back foot on the bench. So front foot's on this pressure point, noticing that. Back foot's up on a bench. And he's kind of doing this split squat and noticing pressure, the pressure in that foot on the ground. And to me, that's almost, and then he would like take off from there. He would fall forward as a unit, like his shins, his whole body, falling forward, noticing foot pressure, and take off. And I would just say, hey, you, what you felt in that, front foot, just notice it, just keep it going. Um, and maybe as I'm talking, it's funny. Cause I like, sometimes I, I like doing these cause it's like, Oh, my thoughts need to like bounce around in my head a little bit. But if I was almost to replace that push cue that maybe would work for that more muscle driven person, mm -hmm. maybe it's that maybe it's pressure, maybe it's ground and press. And when, and when a Darian talks pressure, Dan Paff says it uses that actually, I remember reading Dan Paff says that he uses pressure, right. Yeah. As his, as his primary cue for what the foot is doing on the ground. And maybe I'm maybe I'm interpolating what we're talking about now, but I think some of the idea is that it, it captures more of the idea of sensitivity to when the pressure is applied. Push yes. is kind of a, a sloppy cue in a way, right? Brute like force just, system, yeah. Right? But optimize your pressure on the ground or like, maybe that's too, that's too much, but pressure gives a sense of like, you know, for me as a jiu-jitsu guy, especially, right? Like my pressure is like, very finely tuned sensitivity to knowing where to put pressure at a given time, right? It's a huge difference if I'm pushing down hard on someone's uh, solar plexus versus some other aspect of their body, or if I can dig into their collarbone or their floating rib. Like those are the types of like subtle changes that make it much more likely that they're going to, to feel pressured and give me a response that I want. But anyways, keep going. No, I, love, I, I do as soon as if, if, if Dan path came to that, I, I mean, I actually had no idea, which is kind of, I feel like yeah. that's kind of wrong. I feel like I should have studied that from Dan. And if I'm in that same loop, I, I feel like I'm on the right track, but yeah. that's um. so, yeah. Um, so most of my, yeah, most of my uh, training works like that. And then when I'm working like more upright running, sometimes I'll use like, uh, like low, like wickets that are like, a lot of people use like eight inch tall, but I use four inch or, or less. Cause as soon as it gets too high, you're, you're throwing off the rhythm of the knee lift. Like I said, that guy won the 60 without lifting much. And I, I tend to use it almost as a constraint. A Darian doesn't like the wickets. Cause it kind of, it's like a robot. It, it you're fixed. It's like, okay, six feet apart. Now I'm my stride length is going to be six feet now, basically. So that's now fixed. And it almost limits the drop of the shin and but you can still, I still try to work with that with like different things in the arms. I'll say, Hey, we'll do like single arm runs over sh low wickets and you have to self-organize that or, um, you know, base different. I mean, I've seen other types of drills that people do rhythm based hands up in the air, but I always want to give the athlete like a driver, like a, like upper body driver with like the arms. Maybe we'll hold like a, a pulser, or you could have like a water bottle that has like a quarter of the tank yeah. in it. It's just something that's a driver that gets you in tune of rhythm and that you're learning yourself. You're feeling this out yourself. So those are, that's like a polarization of some of the two things I'll use to help people find their own way. The phrase that's coming to mind with, with some of these things is essentially that 
you're working to attune the athlete to the most important specifying information in the environment, right? So I was thinking about this when I was teaching the, 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 the parkour class for the gymnastics coaches, right? It's actually hard to teach really great parkour in a gymnastics gym because a lot of the information that actually specifies the correct behavior outdoors on concrete or variable natural surfaces isn't present in that environment, right? So if you, if you do a, a shoulder roll on a, on a resi pit mat, right? Whether you rolled over your, um, your, your posterior superior iliac spine to the bumpy part on the back of your hip, it doesn't matter. It has nothing to do with the effectiveness of the roll. But if you're doing that on concrete, it has everything to do with whether you felt okay with that roll or not. So you've removed information from the environment. So as you're talking about this, this, these, uh, these tools that you got from Adarian, what I'm thinking is that essentially you're, you're, you're trying to light up the foot so that the athlete can have better sensitivity to how the way that their foot is interacting with the ground changes their options for movement or increases the capacity to achieve whatever outcome you're looking for. Um, is that a good way to frame what you're trying to do with these things? Yeah, oh, 100%. I think you said it better than I could have. And I think about uh, when David David Gray uh, was on my podcast, David is a, a physio biomechanist from um, Ireland. And he was talking about you know the big craze. I'm sure, I'm sure you're familiar with all this, but you know, oh, everyone go barefoot, go barefoot because your feet, you know, wear socks and shoes and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Okay. I, but going barefoot on a sterile, like smooth surface, isn't going to do a whole lot more than just being in your shoes. Cause there's no information coming in. And mm -hmm. like, did we evolve to run in straight lines on smooth tracks? Like, I mean, I don't know. It's cool, but I don't think our machinery works that way. And so we need to give ourselves yeah, a sensation and I spending my time with swim too. It was really cool. Cause you'll see coaches who use all sorts of sensory tools to just help athletes self-organize You're swimming in fins. You have paddles, you put socks around your feet. So you can't use your feet. You have a, a tower you have also, or, and it's almost like swim has evolved this because it's a 25 meter pool and you just go back and forth a bunch of times and you kind of got to, and the water is 3d. And so you have to find different ways to work with your environment. And I think, and we didn't grow up in the water for the most part. I mean, maybe some of us did, but it's not like we get born in a water birth and then we just, you know, have gills and just go around, you know, we, we are deprived of that environment. And when we are thrown in it, we usually have a swim instructor telling us to do something. You know, it's not like, walking where you just start doing it like like <laughs> when my daughter was this is a rabbit trail but um we we used to go to hawaii with the women's swim team my family and i when i was at cal um every winter for a little bit and in waikiki they have a little like it was perfect because my daughter you know every year when she was little she that just is this very gently sloping like controlled pool area and, and the kids get to go out and um I was, you know, I'm sitting there being, you know, stupid dad and saying, Hey, you know, my daughter's name is Norm. Like watch daddy swim. Like, like as if do it like me. And then, yeah. um, the, one of the, uh, swim consultants there, um, who I've actually referred to his name is Milton Elms. And I learned a ton from him, um, in the world of motor learning, but he's like, he, he's like, well, who taught you how to walk? And I was like, uh, nobody, you know, it's like, what makes swimming special? You know, the human body's equipped to do these things. So just anyways, I just, I learned so much from swim. And that's that just understanding motor learning in that environment and sensory bathing and sensory information and almost like making complexes of it and making it as organic and natural as possible is that's it. Like that's, that's the ticket. So yeah, it's definitely where my coaching is going. When I was nine months old or not when I was nine, when my son was nine months old, we went on a vacation in the Oregon coast. And so we we're, they had this very sandy beach with a very, very slow, gradual, um, like, increase in depth and there was he was playing in this little stream and then but the water would come in and so the, the like the waves would come in and he was just like rushing down crawling as fast as he could into the thing and getting lifted up and dropped down and he would come out of the, the surf just giggling his head off and i remember reading around the time that like given exposure to a, like a sufficiently graded um aquatic environment where a kid can like 
basically just crawl in and then safely crawl out if they start to feel overwhelmed. Kids will self-organize and teach themselves to swim. And unfortunately, I never was able to provide that for my, my kids from that point forward, right? Where they weren't able to just have that kind of environment. Um, but it was a striking idea. And it was, it was one of the most beautiful things that I'd ever seen. The, the, the way that the child was just, like, just, just crawling, right? But totally, absolutely, you know, ecstatic about the information and the play that he was getting from the environment. And it was like, you could imagine that like, if you took that kid every day to the beach, he'd be swimming, you know, probably by the time that he was walking, right? Yeah, and that's, um, Milt, who taught me all these things had said, he spent a lot of time in the Pacific Islands. And he said, yeah. the people who learn to swim basically like that, like in Fiji, kids yeah. grew up in the water. The way they moved was so much more pure than you go to a swim meet and you'll see people just like reaching for positions that their coach told them and they've lost their ability to interact with their environment on that deep sensory level. So tuning people. So part of this idea of the, of the feminine aspect or the yin aspect is that rather than sort of uh, say getting exactly the pattern right or getting increasing the athlete's capacity for force or really trying to do that, uh, I do is, um, increase their sensitivity to optimizing the, the strategy that their body is using in relationship to their environment or um, creating a harmonious movement strategy in relationship to the task in the environment. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I wanna bridge from that too. You know, one of the interesting things about you to me is you're a, you're a track coach, right? And you've taken an interest in parkour and like, so you, you'll post things and be like best warm ups, like parkour. And, and I have this whole thing about how parkour is this extraordinary self-education system. And it doesn't seem to me like a lot of the industry has really grokked how revolutionary what's happened within parkour is. You know, I was talking to the gymnastics coaches last night and saying like, look, there, there's guys out there in parkour who are self-taught doing D-level gymnastics skills. Um, you know, they're like, what the hell, like off a metal bar outside? Are you crazy? Um, so tell me a little bit about kind of the encounter with parkour for you as a coach and how you incorporate it and like what, how it's changed your view of, of how we approach um, building adaptable athletes for whatever context we want to work in. Yeah, so actually I'll take it back to, uh, you mentioned Dan Path and this was yeah. in, Actually, this is funny. This is full circle. This was in the same John Kiley article where he talked about the person whose calf was like, you know, messed up and still ran. Well, he talked about, I think, I think, I think Dan was using this or at least uh, maybe experimenting with this, but basically people running where uh, you put like a series of tape marks on the ground, kind of like the mini, the mini, the wickets, like I mentioned, but instead of having them at symmetrical distances, like seven feet, seven feet, seven feet, it might be like seven feet, five feet, six and a half feet. And it's different every time. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, as soon as I saw, I was like, whoa. And so the, my first adaptation was, well, why don't you be do that with bounding? Like, that'd be fun. I've been doing bounding a long time. It's kind of getting boring. I really can't think of a whole lot more to do. Um, and so I would start doing that as the warm up. is I would say, okay, I'm just put some cones out, different colors or whatever, ideally different colors. I've heard more co different colors are better mentally for the athlete for whatever reason. Yeah. Um, and so, so just to provide another set of information to attune to, right? Yeah. Yeah. More sensory rich, I, I guess. Yeah. Like it's, it's almost like, yeah, you start to associate a step with something pops out at you more, I suppose you could say too. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm not that good into all that stuff, but it makes sense to me intuitively. Like if I was to do that. And so I started with, and I noticed that um, like, like a circuit that would work really well, or even a series is start variable. Like, what we talked about when you were on uh, just on my show or doing the recording for my show was basketball being such a good warm up because it's highly variable, it's sensory rich, and then you can narrow that variability down and go do some dunks. Like, and every person I've worked with, a lot of online clients will always, you know, I, I can never write them a warm up that's as good as them playing a pickup game or two and then going and doing dunks ever. And mm -hmm. you also have social factors, you have your peers there. And so, but one of the things I think is the variable stimulus because it's like doing the same thing over and over again. And, and you could even say, I think it was Stefan Jones on my podcast, who's a motor learning guy and cricket um, coach in the UK. 
he said that Christian Thibodeau, a strength coach had said, every time you even do two strength sets, like, and I, 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 I'm trying to dissect this because sometimes when people write strength workouts, they will have flat loading in an early phase, meaning I do bench press three sets of 10. They're all with, let's say I was really strong. They're all with 300 pounds. <laughs> or for me, maybe my phase, next phase, because I haven't been lifting is 150 or 135. I don't know. Uh, but they're all flat. Okay. But according to Christian, every time you do repeat the same set over, so I do 135 and the next set I do 135, he says it screws you up neurologically. Like, your nervous system doesn't like it. Other, but again, I don't know. Maybe there's some people who are more like different neurotypes or whatever that do like that. But I just think if you do the same thing over and over, eventually you found your limit. And I'm sure you've seen this with doing um, like trying to master a, a trick on the a parkour setup. You, and I've seen this for like long. And that's a different it's in, it's interesting because you could say finite games, infinite games like in track and field. A lot of times you'll get someone doing long jump and it's just like one more jump. Just do one more jump today. Just do one more jump. But the thing is, after you've done four five, six of the same run up, take off, maybe your coach says something, your nervous system will start to contract. And and uh, working with a Darian, like a Darian is very sensitive and he'll see that point where like almost the nervous system contracted like you're done. Like you have to do something else. Um, yeah. You know, you could do. You could go do a different event. You could go do a 200 meter sprint and come back. You know, you could do run the hurdles. The hurdles is great. That's the best thing to put in between any event in track and field because it's the most variability. It's 3D. It's like super reactive. I had my best, um, my best high school long jump actually came right after running the 110 hurdles at the conference championship. I long jumped and then I went and ran the hurdles and then I came right back to long jump and jumped a foot farther instantly, like magic, right? Like. That like shot of variability. And there's also a little bit, you could say with like, um, I very, there's also uh, energy systems is also variability. So doing like a shot of work that's 20 to 40 seconds hard is also a serious dose of variability to the point where I could contrast like a long jump and a 110 hurdles and just go back and forth or a 300 hurdles if I was feeling a little, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that would be rough yeah. i might not be able to do too many of those <laughs> so i actually i almost don't even know where i was going here i probably did lose my i lost myself because i got so excited talking because that's been something recently that i've been excited about but. Let me, i could run with that for a second because i think it's interesting because i was talking to this uh about this recently and I, I think it's such an interesting concept but the, the idea of random practice versus block practice and the kind of results you get from it right so um you know, for the audience, if they're not familiar, block practice is like you do all of one thing and then you go do all of something else, right? So you're going to do, uh, you know, five sets of five deadlifts and then you're going to go do your bounds, right? And then you're going to go do your push ups, et cetera. Whereas random practice is like, okay, maybe you have an hour to do it and you're going to do some deadlifts and some, some, uh, some bounds and some pull ups and you just kind of go back and forth between them as you feel, right? Um, and so the, the motor learning research, as I understand it, says generally random practice results in better skill acquisition over time. But what's interesting about it is that it often results in uh, like a, a slightly lower result from the session, right? So you, you won't get quite as much better from the beginning of the session to the end of the session, but you get better from this session to the next session. Right, there's more improvement from session to session. But uh, I was just talking to people yesterday about this and I, I then got a chance to play around in the gym after my, my session, right? And so I like, okay, I had a few things that I was working on. So I was working on uh, the front flip I was telling you about, and I was working on a corkscrew back flip off of, uh, uh, off of an elevated surface. And then I was working on a full twisting, uh, like full twist, and then in a front flip off the trampoline. And so I intentionally did them all in sequence. So I would go full twisting front flip, come up do the the corkscrew then go back and, and run and do the um the, the front flip over the the thing and at a certain point i had grooved in the corkscrew to a level that i was really excited about and so i was like okay i'm just gonna hit a block of these and the, the weird thing was that like as soon as i tried to do just that skill it actually started to disorganize it started to become less effective right it was like there was something that was keeping my nervous system fresh about going and seeing these other skills and I, like, um, I've seen Rob Gray on his podcast, Perception Action Podcast, podcast has, has proposed that there's a, that, um, that, that you can kind of look at this as like how much total information is there 
right? And if there's, if there's kind of not enough total information through a period of time, then the athlete sort of becomes stagnant and bored. And if there's too much, they can get anxious and overwhelmed. And so you want to hit that, that medium point. Um, but uh, I, I, I think there's something very interesting with, with that idea. And I think it's very counterintuitive for most people to come up with through strength and conditioning where we really kind of want to treat people as machines. So I'm curious for your experience with that. How do you, how do you play with block practice or random practice and in, in, in what kind of results have you seen? Yeah, I'd love to talk about that. And actually, I remember where I got lost is I wanted to talk about how I had that parkour. I'll keep that short because I'll say yeah. I, it's only been like true parkour maybe or, or those principles is only a few places. One is actually recovery days. If athlete has access to trees and nature, I'll send them on runs where I just say interact with the environment. Just today's your recovery day. Just go run, maybe see a tree, go climb it go try to jump over some branches, do pull-ups on branches, like, and, and keep it low intensity. And I find, I think just that variability, just going for an easy run, as long as you're an elastic person and it's not hard for you and throwing that in an environment has been helpful. Um, other things I've done is, um, I've used actually roughhousing more, by the way, from your work in my yeah. teams, I would say, um, just because I, I like I liked what you said about the idea of putting a smile on an athlete's face before, yeah, yeah. The session and so using i we do rough housing depending on the team we would do like little games um and then where the parkour elements more came in was i once athletes were getting bored with just you know i've worked with an athlete for three four years and we're using like we're doing like a french contrast set which is and i'll talk about this for the block here in a second but that would be like do a hex bar deadlift with 80 percent, so kind of heavy then go do a, a jump up to a box or box to box jump a heavy plyometric if you will then do a light like you know, light hex bar at 30%, as fast as you can or something, and then do a, a speed plyo. So like, I don't know, 20 jump ropes as fast as you can or 30 line hops, something fast. So that would be the traditional sequence. What I started to do was like that, that depth jump. I started to say, hey, instead of just as high as you can or the box jump, I would maybe put like little um, circles on the ground, like little dots and say jump. Yeah, I would put them in a random pattern and just to keep yeah. information fresh. And for those athletes, a lot of times that wasn't necessarily what we were doing, like a jump in swimming, the box jump might not be that specific to what they're doing. Maybe the wall, that's it, you know, one small proportion of the race. And we can't get too good at that relative to everything else. You know, you want to keep everything in balance. Right. Um, but cause so obviously we're not going to like make them a great swimmer by jacking their squat max to the, the utmost. And we always want to improve your vertical, but uh, we would, you know, just to have that information change it, they there's, there's a smile on their face. They had more fun doing it. I just felt like that's where the change would happen a lot of times, just taking plyos we've done a long time and then injecting some sort of random variability to them. So that and recovery uh, were the two from more of the parkour perspective. Or um, some of my colleagues, um, Austin Yoakum in Minneapolis, and uh, Michael Zwiefel, who he's with like, the uh, emergence group with Sean Mishka and those guys, uh, they do a lot of this. And I, if I had groups, I would do it. Um, I mostly work with individuals right now. But just like just doing a warm up and doing like um, like a crawl parkour, just throwing some mats, random mats and plyo boxes. And I've done this and just say, hey, just get from point A to point B and you can't touch the ground and you have to crawl. So you have to figure out how to get over these this way. And I love that stuff. So they're doing that. And I, or I, I have done like monkey bars, go across the monkey bars and I'll put some boxes in the way and say, you can't use these bars. You have to find a way over. Uh, I would do that for the warm up too. So um, those have been the main ways there. Um, so block practice though, and random. So where I've gone, um, let me just, I'll, I'll speak in terms of French contrast. Cause you talked about that, um, uh, with the, the, um, John, the, bounds and, and deadlifts, right. That was my, yeah. my example. Yeah. And so, um, I run this, this, how I'm going to explain this kind of as explain, uh, explains where I'll go in two different ways. So, uh, like a French contrast is one of my favorite setups. Um, but again, with anything, you can get bored of it over time. I, I wouldn't necessarily want to do this all year because eventually it just becomes standard. And you kind of want to like, in the course of a season, I kind of want to save the more potent setups till um, later. So I'll basically, I might see how long we can get by just improving with regular plyometrics. Let's say an athlete wants to jump higher and this is simplifying it, but maybe for the first few months of training, we just say, all right, you're going to do hurdle hops and you're going to do one set of 20 squats or something real simple. Right. And we're just going to see how long they get better on that really simple stuff. 
And then once they finally start to peter off, then I'll say, okay, now we're going to get to the, the French contrast, the exciting stuff. Um, because I want to like, I really want to ride out that dopamine effect and the, the adaptation on the simple means before I try to put more intensity. So, but once I do get to the block, that block stuff, and it's, it's maybe it's kind of different because for me, the French contrast, as opposed to what you said, where you're doing random learning and it's not as good now, but it's better over time. I feel like French contrast is almost like a really specific type of blocked that is wave loaded in a very symmetrical manner that will get you better short term. Um, yeah, you it's can. Kind of opposite. What I was, in some sense, what I was doing. So, like, if you think about a um, a spectrum from a completely blocked practice to a completely random practice, right? So, French contrast is kind of in the middle, right? It's 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 yep. not completely blocked in the sense that you're doing the same skill uh, until you're done with that skill and then moving to the next skill, right? That, like, that's going to be the least interesting, the least kind of uh, engaging. And also it doesn't require, one of the things that, that, I, that I understand from the motor learning research is that whenever you interrupt one skill with another skill, you're practicing the ability to remember that skill. So if I have a specific way of organizing my body to do a deadlift by, by doing a, a bound series before I come back to the deadlift, I'm interrupting my, my brain remembering that pattern and then I'm having to go back to remember that pattern. As well as I'm also potentially potentiating my nervous system to have uh, more variable ways, right? Of achieving the same thing, right? I'm showing it other pathways of motor control that potentially could could pay in that that's an idea that just occurs to me um but then like a completely random practice would be like uh well like in parkour like you often have like completely random practice where you're you you don't have a you don't have a you you're not going to do a specific amount of any jump you just jump this jump until you're bored with it and then you do some other jump and you kind of like just mix and match um but then you could have something that's in between right where you're like okay or the idea that I was proposing there was you could say, let's say that I want to do 25 deadlifts with, uh, with 300 pounds and I want to do this. I could do however many, I could just aim to finish them all within a specific period of time and then randomly mix them as much as I want. Go ahead, yeah. keep going. Yeah, no, I, I like that. It's, I mean, this is it really. Like to me, I, I, I mean, I'm sure you feel this too is like, it's almost like, the goal of all this in some ways is to return us to who we are as human beings in the training. It's like the micro and the macro and it's who we are and it's how children learn and it's how, and so even um, like you said, the ability to remember a skill, because the idea is, well, if it's not, if you're not remembering the skill, then why is it in the program? You know, like even that example I gave, like, oh, you're going to do hurdle hops in a one by 20 or whatever of a lift. Um, well, that's not, it's not blocked. And let's just say you're getting better on that for a while. And actually in, in actual practice, I, it's funny because I'll say this in my actual programs, you don't even see that you won't see this that often. It's, it's a lot of circuits and it's been more circuits and I can get into some of the running, the running circuits, actually locomotion circuits have been big for me recently mm -hmm. because it all comes back to reciprocal action, reciprocal human movement, those mm -hmm. figure eights. That's what it all comes back to. And I don't want to ever get away from that too far. So um, yeah, usually if I have lifting that's strength oriented, it's just one set of 10, one set of 15, that's it. I don't want it. And it's, if it's on an Island, <laughs> cause yeah. I don't want to have four sets of five on an Island, if that makes sense. Cause that Island could start to change your structure and you don't remember that skill properly. And it just might not be great. Um, so, uh, let me go into some of the things that I'll do. Like, I'll give you an example. This actually isn't French contrast, but I recently had a strength coach, um, who visited me, who, you know, shadowed and asked some questions last week. Uh, at my gym. And so I, a lot of um, pro and college strength coaches, usually they're stronger than they are fast. Um, it's probably pretty par for the course. Um, done a lot of lifting, great squats and cleans, but they, they're jumping and um, sprinting and movement ability might not reflect how strong they are. And so uh, the circuit we did was we were running a 20 yard dash. I had the timing gate set up and then we did uh, like a foot pressure drill. Um, and then we did, we skipped speed, skipped to 120 uh, or 150 as fast as we could, or pretty fast. And that speed skip took 15 a seconds. Lot of skip. Oh, dude, I love long skipping. That's, that's an Adarian, Adarian's base training for track is like, let's go skip like, I don't know, 10 by a hundred or something or, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but anyways, which we could talk about that, why I like that. Um, 
I, I, I don't know if I do 10 by hundred. I like, but I like the waving. I like waving it like, like sprint a short. And so what I find is for people who are a bit, you could call it muscle bound, the technical yeah. term pressure, it's an inhaled, you know, skeleton, whatever. They're better at squatting. They're not very elastic. They can't organize their body in the air properly. Skipping is almost like the ultimate self-organized in the air movement. Um, Cause like massive co-contractions and self-organization in the air to get to the next step. And so um, we would do this and actually I'm already pretty good at skipping. So this didn't help me that much, but this guy who every time he did the 20 literally was taking one tenth off his 20 as every time he did the skip and came back to it. Um, so we did three rounds. So it was like, did the sprint, went did the skips, came back ran 10th faster. And it was the 10 to 20 split that he was getting better at. And he's just like, I just felt like I could move. I didn't have to try harder. Um, so for him uh, specifically, that's a great setup. Now for me, I'm already good at organizing in the air. I'm just not very strong for what I could be. And so for me, a better b block practice might be run that 20. Now go do a, I don't know, like a 40 meter sled, like with decently heavy weight. And it's going to take me a while. And I'm actually might feel a little temporary fatigue, but then I'm going to wait like four or five minutes. And I bet you I'm going to be faster at that second. Cause I'm not only just, I'm not just contrasting, um, like, I'm not only contrasting um, like heavy and light. I'm also contrasting how long and how short. Um, if I do that sled too long, I'm going to beat my muscles up and get the, the lactate disorganization. So um, I just really like playing with uh, levels. Like, uh, and there's a book written by a guy. I don't know who wrote this. There's a lot of mystery about it, but it was called The Greatest Sports Training Book Ever. And the writing style is crazy. Like it's just a weird kind of crazy dude. But you read this book. And, and, and the, the person who wrote it, um, like sent it to Dan Fichter, who's a trainer out in New York and claimed to be have a secret compound in Germany and stuff like that. And it sounds crazy. And, and the book's actually no longer in print. Uh, if you want it, email me and I have it on my Dropbox because it's not in print. So I don't feel bad. And it never was in print. It was just an ebook. So I don't feel bad sending it out to people mm -hmm. since it's not for sale and you know, just kind of floats around. But one of the big things, the training constructs in that book was alternating energy brackets. And he had it whoever wrote it had it down to like an an one an two energy bracket one was basically zero to nine seconds somewhere in there and you could mm -hmm. contrast that with a 20 to 40 second like an, a, a max so and he had different ways of finding these things but i do find i really love um you know a short burst a long burst a short burst a long burst uh i just think that they each recover each other and i think that's part of the reason playing basketball is good too it's like you know you run around a little bit playing defense get all tired and then Offense, you get to, you know, just dribble and relax a little, you know what I'm saying? Like the day maybe you do a max jump for a block, like that's sports. So there's, there's, there's skill contrast and then also density contrast. Variability is good, right? Yeah. I remember uh, Franz Bosch and his book was like, hey, we really don't know if any different programming principles work. We just know that athletes like variation over time. Mm-hmm. So I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, levers and collision management and kind of your biomechanical model and the influence of the Darien Bar on your thinking. Um, so I come from, you know, I would say a pretty standard track and field background, right? Like, uh, you know, we're definitely taught to run tall, taught to push. Um, and so I've been exposed to a Darien's work, but I haven't like dug deep into it. And there's elements of it that that are like, okay, I get this, but some of it, the language is very specific and I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm not a hundred percent that I'm on board with this or I don't even exactly know. And, and I'm sometimes when you're talking a lot about these biomechanics, it, it looks like it could be easily turned into something that's over cued versus allowing the athlete to self organize What I've moved from is like, okay, here's your standard model of, of how an athlete should sprint to maybe there's a few principles that we can point people towards, but don't over cue them and just let them organize. And that if you, if you have them get stronger and you have them get more elastic and you have them run a lot, then they're going to get faster. So why are, what are the lever actions that we should be aware of in applying force to the ground and how are, you know, um, how are those being missed kind of in the, the track and field world? You know, what, what is this perspective on levers that we should understand? Yeah, so the the biggest and I think most obvious and the easiest one is 
because the Darien will have all sorts of class one, two, and three levers. And, and I'm just, I do start to lose it at some, not, not like lose it. Like I'm just like running around my basement, like running into walls, like, <laughs> but uh, I'm like, I lose my train of thought with, I'm, I'm trying to follow where he's going. Um, I had the good fortune to spend years, uh, like once pretty much on the weekends, almost every weekend for a long time, just getting coached by him in person. And that's where all the gaps got filled in for me in many ways. I've might not understand something and then I could actually go do it and go do it enough times to feel it in my own body, what he was talking about, which again, the feeling, I think that was an and understanding how timing works and how the feeling works. And so with the levers, the foot is the easiest, by far the easiest lever to understand. And that's the one I'll focus on. And so the foot and the ankle can either work as a class one lever, um, which is like a seesaw. So, and Think about if the foot's flat on the ground, like when we squat and we keep the foot flat and the heel down and the knees come forward over the toes and hopefully we do let them. Um, hopefully, you know, that's a, a big, you know, paradigm that's falling is don't put your knees over your toes and it's good to see that. So as the knees come forward, that's, and the heel stays down, um, that's a class one, like seesaw action lever. If you're looking at, I think the fulcrum point, like that middle support of the seesaw would be like the ankle bone and then the on the outside yeah. is the achilles so i'm uh, so that's your class one and that is actually more uh of, of in sprinting it's more breaking forces actually as adarian puts it i've flip-flopped that in my head probably incorrectly in the past but that's when the heel is down that's when you get breaking forces like if you're a heel striker you're yeah. applying massive breaking force to the ground um then so the thing is you don't usually get this in squatting so uh, a class two is basically like, let's just say if I'm running, I'm running and I put my foot down and my foot hits, maybe it hits flat. Maybe I hit heel first, but at some point as my knee starts to pass over my foot, the heel will pick up off the ground. And now my fulcrum is on the balls of the feet. So you don't just run on the balls of your feet. You do roll through, but you'll, you'll hit strike. Maybe you strike midfoot and then you roll up onto the balls of your feet and the heels off the ground. And as the heel's coming up off the ground, now you're in a class two lever mode. It's like a, like a nutcracker, you could say, or a scissors. Actually, maybe not a nutcracker. Scissor, or yeah, nutcracker. Sorry, it is a nutcracker. I get this mixed up in my head. You're a nut so now um, it's a little bit, that's where you can start reapplying speed. So you have the anchor of the ball of the foot, and now the body is passing over that anchor of the ball of the foot. And if you look at um, like data and charts on great, good sprinters um, in track, they have greater braking forces than less elite sprinters, but for a shorter period of time. So it's like those, they are in class one mode, although their heel might kiss the ground, you know, it's not going to slam on the ground, but they're going to have a really, really short and brief class one period. And then they're getting a class two real fast. So they're getting, they're, they're, they're working their way, twisting their way to the ball of the foot. And Adarian talks about Usain Bolt and says he does a really good job of getting to class two faster um, okay. than other athletes. So, um, just being aware of that. And it also gives us some other ideas for the weight room, I think too. Um, and Olympic lifting as well, different, different ways of looking at how that lever transpires from a class one to a class two in the foot and the ankle. So if you, so basically the understanding here is that, um, when an athlete is sprinting, the goal is to get from the class one to the class two lever faster. What about when athletes are jumping? Like if you're looking at a big, powerful single leg jump or a big, powerful two leg jump, uh, how, how, do, how do we think about the relationship of those uh, two different level lever actions? Same thing. Um, so I like watching, um, I post this every now and then it was Aaron Gordon in the 2019 dunk contest, I want to say. And you'll see this in a lot of dunkers, especially dunks that involve a spiraling action. So it's like you plant mm -hmm. and you don't just plant sagely straight ahead one, two like the second or the penultimate will come down and the block foot actually spins like a top around a hit. There's mm -hmm. rotational energy. Um, and a lot of times you'll see that that block foot actually come down and the heel isn't even touching the ground. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's coming down in class one mode. Cause they like, they're just, they're just getting off the ground. And they're I think using that, class one mode to create the breaking action on the penultimate step, right? When you're doing a, a two yes. foot jump. Yes, that's the break. This, the penultimate is the break. And by the time they're to the, the last step, that's just got to be all speed. And so that's where... And that's even happening on a, on a one-foot jump, right? Sorry to interrupt you there. But on a one-foot jump, the, the penultimate step 
also can act as a break. Is that true? Uh, yes, but it shouldn't be too much of a break. So in a one leg jump, and this is actually, this is something that I think could be transported right over to parkour or whatever yeah. you're doing is jumping high off the run is a very different skill than squatting. Um, now I mean, squatting will help your jump off the run. Uh, maybe not one leg jump as much. Um, it actually could hurt your one leg jump potentially if you do it too much, too much class one lever in a squat. Um, and then the, the, the structural changes from too much squatting, but I don't want to get into that, but the, um, so Darian talks about, you don't accelerate into the plant unless you got like no run up. Like if I have three steps, yeah, I'm probably going to accelerate into the plant. But if I got like a lot of that, by the way, in parkour, a lot oh, of three steps. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, then you probably will for the most part, but even in like a five step, watch a five step, watch someone, you know, drive a basketball player. They're, they're going 20, 15, 20 feet from the, the three point line. They're cut going past somebody. And then they're going to jump and dunk on somebody. You're usually going to see one to two steps of hard acceleration where they're accelerating. And then if, I mean, I don't have, you know, the GPS data piece on them, but I would be willing to bet that they don't accelerate anymore into the plant. They actually maintain their speed and they don't slow down. And maybe that's probably what's more worth arguing about is just the fact that you don't slow down. And the people who slow down less into the takeoff will jump higher. You will slow down more in the takeoff if the second to last the penultimate step. So let's say I'm taking off my left foot, I'm going to go dunk on someone. If my right foot, the step before that left foot hits, if that heel is on the ground too long in class one, like think of like a pistol squat with my heel on the ground. If that yeah. right leg is in pistol squat mode as I'm passing over, that's slowing me down. So I will be slower going into my last step and I will not jump as high. So uh, sometimes in teaching someone to be better, you just need to teach them class one. And so a Darian, for example, may have you stand on a block or a bench, like you're going to do a single leg squat. But as you drop down, you're letting the heel come up as your knee comes forward. Or perhaps you're actually letting the knee come up and then just dropping forward off the bench. Or that's what I basically kind of similar to what I do with that lineman is as he's dropping on to when he's set up and he's got the foot, you know, the Darian's foot thing, and he's dropping down onto that putting pressure. I'm telling him to lift his heel and feel pressure as his heel lifts. Cause that was when he started, that was his fault was he, he didn't get to class two very well. And so we're trying to teach him as the knee goes forward, as you're dropping down into the staggered squat, pressure, the balls of the feet, transverse arch, let the heel come up in the class um, two mode. And then we're trying to rehearse that. And then we're working with it as we go along. So um, I, I do a lot of that in the warmups. We'll do different like skater squats or bowler squats. If anyone's familiar with that, basically like a single leg squat, like instead of a pistol, you have the other leg behind you and you're just letting the heel come up as your knee comes forward and you're twisting different ways. I'll say like, do that squat, let your heel come up into class one, make sure you have pressure in the balls of the feet. And then it's like a little dome because that's what those insoles kind of create a dome in the balls of the feet. And then we'll twist to either side of the big toe too. We'll, we'll twist the knee in internal, we'll twist the knee to external. So there's a twisting element too in helping that. Um, along. So it, we'll, we're trying to teach that idea and skill, and then we're trying to infuse it into something that's more dynamic. Cool. So when, when I was start, first starting to, to kind of research this stuff, right, you start to understand the role of the penultimate step, getting the hips down on a penultimate step. And so I could see the athletes that I worked with, like a lot of the athletes who couldn't take off well, uh, just their hip didn't change position at all. But I found that as soon as I cued an athlete to try to get their hip down, they'd create a big breaking action and then that would hurt what they were doing. And like when I was working with Mike, he, he basically said like, don't think about your hip going down at all. Just think about jumping high on your last step, right? If you, if you think about the last foot driving you up into the air on a long jump, um, then your hip will go down before it. But like just recently with the front flips, like, and with Kong vaults and front flips, I would say that we found that it is often a very useful cue to tell the athlete to intentionally lower the hip as they're coming into their, their, uh, their setup, right? That split, uh, that split foot setup. If you come in with your hips too high, you can't load the, the rear leg and you just sort of pass over the rear leg and you end up basically doing only a one-legged jump and the, the last, the, the, the rear leg's not really uh, applying force to the ground effectively. So I'm, I'm curious how you think about, uh, about when 
it's appropriate to, to, to cue the athlete to actually be getting the hips down in preparation for a jump versus when that's going to result in breaking actions or how we avoid it resulting in breaking actions. Yeah. So if we're talking about not parkour, like the ground, like a sterile ground yeah. environment, I guess in parkour, you probably are running up, you know, to your runups are oftentimes flat or ground. Sure. Sure. There's uh, lots of concrete flat runups. Yeah. So in, I'll, I'll actually go back to my experience in club track and field. So I also have uh, seven years of experience working with club track, like kids ages eight to 14, which I'm really happy that I spent time there. Cause I've heard it said the more as a track coach, I honestly think as any coach, the more time you could spend with different age groups and age brackets along this whole developmental chain, the more you can learn. And so I would see that's oftentimes, um, I work with different events, usually high jump, sometimes helping sprints and running and stuff. And occasionally I'd film for long or triple javelin, but the, um, the, the long jump coach would always, his favorite was just to put a bungee out and have the kids jump over it to teach them to jump up, which is great. However, you're also getting a Rob Peter to pay Paul scenario. That's a, no, like Dan Paff. I've heard him say that a lot of times is you're, you're, you're creating a favorable adaptation, but you're also creating a lagging unfavorable adaptation. And the unfavorable adaptation for those kids was that band was too high and they had to pull both legs high too early to get over it. So they're actually, and they, and they're actually screwing up their potential landing. Cause they're also, it, it's just, it's this nice tool, but you shouldn't be like the foundation of what you do. You know what I'm saying? Because now you're, you're creating a different event for the young athlete. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I would, um, what I ended up doing it's well, yeah, it's, it's kind of like, look, like all well, these drills, we'll just go through jump, just jump. And if you can do it, I'm not going to mess with it. Like, it, it, like you're saying the, the goal is to jump high and far into the pit. If the athlete can do that, cool. I'm just going to set up your run and we'll work on some rhythms and maybe do a few takeoff drills and rhythm dr drills. And you're good. I'm not really going to say that much to you. Um, I do like occasionally working, like maybe giving some awareness of the back arm behind the body. Cause that can set up the forward leg. Uh, but beyond that, I'll just leave it. Um, but if the athlete can't do it and you could get a lot of these young athletes who would run and they just wouldn't get up off the board, they're just like flat into the pit. And so what I really, I, what I found worked very effectively, and I always tried to teach this because I felt like there was these different things that a track athlete should be able to do. And one of which is squatted running, which is another Adarian bar thing. And that's like the bizarro universe. Cause if you're in track, it's all run tall and lift your knees and step over the knee and blah, blah, blah. So yeah. squatted running is like the bizarro universe. Like nobody uses that. <laughs> and I came from a realm where I, um, I ran tall and did all that stuff for years. Like, I mean, I, I literally like, I had, I got the free lap timing system when I was like 30, 31, maybe 32. I don't know, somewhere in my early thirties. So I was always running fly tens and I was always, and I was just like stuck at this horrendous time of like, I mean, this is, it's almost embarrassing to say, cause I was a seven foot high jumper and 46 foot triple jumper. I was a good athlete. And in high school, I ran like about close to 11 flat and the four by one lead off on the relays and stuff. So I was okay. Like, but I could not break 1.10 on the fly 10, which is really bad. If you're a track coach listening to this, like they basically just probably turned this off and said, okay, this guy was good <laughs> until he told me he couldn't do this, but I was always going through and I, I was doing, I was like, oh, it's like, man, I'm running taller. And I would always try to fix it by running taller, lifting my knees more cycling, stepping over more. And it, I, the more I would try that stuff, I would just go slower. And then I ran a Darian and um, he actually had me squat more. And in the process of learning to run more squatted, I actually, I ran 105 at, at age 34. Like I, you know, I was at three years after three years of all that stuff, I ran 105, which is okay. It's not good. I think if I was in my early twenties, maybe I could have been close to 100. Um, yeah. So not bad, but anyways, I'll just take this over to long jump is I would teach people how to run in a squatted position, which basically involves just, you get exceptional at mid stance. You can fold up in the air well, and you can do it while maintaining a good posture. And you get used to kind of like almost like bouncing off of a squatted position. Like a lot of people will be squatted and they stay class one way too long and their, their momentum will goes down into the ground. So basically we're just learning to operate in this position and we would teach them that. And I've had success athletes who couldn't get up. I would say, all right, I'm put two cones, uh, five yards from the board and I, or seven yards from the board. And I'd say, all right, when you get to these cones, just start running squatted. Like we just practiced and all of a sudden they're going up, you know what I'm saying? Like, so it's kind of like you learn the rhythm. They have to learn the rhythm of that. And over time, they can start sorting it out. I mean, you shouldn't have to start. If you start doing that every time you hit the cone, you're eventually going to, you know, technical ceiling yourself. Like it just has to be a sensory tool. So 
Um, that squatted run actually could be a, another way too to help people learn to maintain low and then get up off. Yeah. Sorry, I'm thinking about the the idea of like being low without being pushy. Yeah. Right? So I was thinking about this in reference to the the front flip that I was doing because it's like thinking about that collision of that second to last leg and I have a history of knee pain on that side, right? And so I think that my body is doing a bunch of things to prevent me from 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 overstressing that knee. But when I was when I was working on this yesterday, I for whatever reason the cue that popped into my brain was like low but soft on that leg, right? Like just just receive that 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 foot that uh, penultimate foot softer, right? And then all of a sudden it was like floaty, right? I was just flying on this thing. Um, like when you watch when you watch a lot of athletes though, like that impact that that collision looks very intense on that second to last step, the penultimate step in a two foot takeoff. But I'm imagining that if you're, if you're thinking about that push as you're preparing for a long jump, that it's gonna to tend to, to, to push you in a direction of creating too hard of breaking actions and you're gonna lose a lot of speed. Whereas if you can stay squatted without creating those breaking actions, that's gonna be loading that elasticity and giving you the ability to get down to get back up. Yeah, so the, the key to good squatty so, running is learning to um, be elastic in the squatty run to the point where you're not muscling. If you can get in flexion and not muscle it, that's where it's at. And I think when we think squatting, we think muscle, we think quads, but it, in reality, it's more learning to use the, the free energy return mechanisms of the body out of a deeper seated position than you're normally used to. And so a good squatty run is what you're going to see is you're going to see still getting to class two lever, getting to the ball of the foot and the speed generated in the squatty run is a massive shin drop. So the knee will drop way forward and that's what helps propel you. If you were doing that squatted running and you're, we're leaving the heels down a real long time and you're, we're overstretching the Achilles. Well, now that squatty run is probably not serving you. Um, but that's where you'll start with just, you know, Darian will say pinky toe up that kind of loads the arches. There's different things you can do. But basically, I have an athlete. He's actually my training partner now. He um, he has a bad habit of he was a power lifter for a long time. Trained with Louis Simmons actually a little bit, um, yeah. very strong. Um, but he like almost I would call it calves everything. Like he like almost loads the muscles of his calf in late stance every step excessively, and then pushes off with excessive plantar flexion. So we've had to regress him. And for a squatty run for anything, like it ultimately really comes back to a regression of just little single leg hops in place or moving forward where he holds his toes up in the air. Like as soon as he feels he's gripping or overusing his calf, he has to stop. And so he has to go all the way back to that position and then we work it out from there. So um, it can be anywhere from starting there. I basically, can you squatty run? Can you do single leg hopping without gripping your toes and using your calf too much? Can you spiral force? Uh, and then those skills can work together in that ultimate output. You just have to play around with, you know, who it is, what they need. Yeah, I feel like you know, you and I can go on on that topic. I think there's a lot of interesting stuff there to uh, to kind of dig into between what uh, what you know we in the parkour community can learn about optimizing our our movement or general movement community, and also what what we're doing already that would really help other folks. One thing I wanted to get to before we go, and I realize I've kept you for a long time here, is the role of internal rotation at the hip and pronation and like how we separate that from like a valgus knee fault that's actually dangerous. So one of the things that I think a lot of people are surprised by with say a Darian's perspective is this idea of being on the inside edge and what that can offer you. Like, um, you know, Kelly Stratton is a good friend of mine always says, you know, the fastest athletes in the world run with their feet straight. And so I remember coming across a Darian bar and going and watching a video of Justin Gatlin and it's like on the first large number of strides, <laughs> I don't remember how many, maybe five strides, you can see that that foot is turned out and he is up on, you know, that big toe basically. So how, do, but I also believe that there is a, a real problem of, of a valgus knee fault that is injuring people. And I have a history of this myself, right? Like I, um, I badly sprained each ankle eight times 
between 12 and 18 years old. Um, and I was told like, if I sprain you to the ankle again, I'd have a permanent impingement. And I think that like the neurological function of my feet and ankles was damaged for a really long time after that. So I actually wanted to show you a couple videos and, and talk about this because um, I want to be able to distinguish these two things better. So I'm going to share my screen here. So for those of you watching on or listening on, 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 on the podcast, you can go watch these videos. Arbor flow is my first video from 20, uh, 2011. And then we'll look at the next video from 2012 and you'll see a huge change in the way my feet move on the ground. So I'm going to just move it forward a little bit. And turn the music off. So I want you to watch how, how my feet tend to land on the ground. See that foot turned out there, knees in, sloppy. This one's really big. Uh, can you see this? Yeah, it's a little grainy and a little slow, but I, I could see the last one just barely. I can't see what you're talking about. Nice, uh, I like the clean shave in it. You look completely different there. <laughs> <laughs> so see, see how my foot is hitting here? All yeah. Right. And then same, same kind of foot position here. Boom. Big turnout coming up there. Same thing there. Okay, this one. Oh yeah, I see that. that position. So, I mean, this is, uh, you know, I'm certainly on the inside edge of my foot. Yes. <laughs> this looks like a completely broken position to me, right? And now if we go and look just, you know, uh, a year later, um, you can see this is at a time when I really went into a lot of barefoot training. And this was also when, um, when I had switched from using the deadlift to the split squat as my primary um, training, uh, uh, lower body training. Okay. So look at the way that my feet interact with the ground. So ball of the foot, ball of the foot, balls of the feet. Yeah, class two there. Class two. So I'm getting into the class two much more effectively, I guess. Yes. So I've developed, you know, like there's this idea of the heel foot versus the, the, the toe foot. Right. And it looks like basically in the first video, I just have no ability to have sensitivity to an awareness of moving on, uh, the toe foot. And then all of a sudden you can see a massive change in that here. So that's what I wanted to show you. And I'm, I'm curious how you distinguish between positive ability to utilize internal rotation and pronation, why those are so important, and then how we look at that versus that classic uh, kind of sloppy valgus fault that we see all, with a lot of athletes and how we get people out of that while retaining the ability to utilize um, effective inside edge and internal rotation. Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, so a little disclaimer before I start this, I, I have a lot of interest in, in the course of doing my own podcast, I come across people who are much more knowledgeable and detailed about this whole area than I am. So I can speak from as much of like the 80 20 principle as I know the 20% yeah. that I know, that I think will give you 80%. Uh, but sure. for the rest of it, refer to the work of Bill Hartman, and people who are taking his work are doing a really phenomenal yeah. job there. Mike Kozak, um, I, I, he was up in Columbus. He calls it knees in for the win and knees in to lose. Like Mike's the performance guy and he's had physical therapists well-versed in that. So I, I, he's, and what I've learned from him, cause I've gone through case studies of this. Cause it's kind of like, you can, it's easy to get on a pendulum and be polarizing. It's easy to say, man, well, any knees in is terrible. And which is sadly way too many coaches because you actually set yourself up for injury with when you do that. Um, and I mean, there's still a lot, a lot, a lot of strength coaches who are still in the knees out, sit back mentality. And there's I mean, our injuries ain't getting better. I'll tell you that much. Like right now in the NFL, it's like a foot in Achilles, Achilles tendon epidemic. And when we don't give the range, like if your knee can't internally rotate, or doesn't want to, as it should, when there's forces coming up to it or down to it through the hip, and it only can give you so much range. Now the force has to go somewhere else. And so we need a certain amount of internal rotation as a damper and uh, an ability to load elastically. So Mike, as I've gone, um, I've shared um, 
uh, I guess you could call it just case studies, video case studies with Mike Kozak and his former physical therapist partner was a guy named Stephen Laflamme. They were on my podcast about a year ago. And they, we talked about that a lot. Knees that win, knees in to win or knees in to lose. So that's your, that's your two, that's your easy moniker. It's either knees in to win or knees in to lose. And a lot of it is the timing as I learned from Mike. Uh, again, I'm, I, and so I think what you can see is watch like a standing vertical. And if, as the athlete is loading in that standing vertical, and this might change for like reactive jumps, but just for a general rule of thumb, as they drop down, you're going to see the knees either neutral or externally rotating a little bit as they load. Once they hit the bottom point and they start needing to reverse, you're going to see the knees actually start to come inwards. They have to do that for you to jump as high as you can. If the knees are not coming inwards, you're not going to get the correct pressure and pressurization and propulsion in that midpoint. And so the and then as you're extending and, and like starting to get towards the toe off, the knees are going to start coming back out. That's like the whip you'll see. And you will see in the standing vert, people's toes actually will, will go out and start to into a little bit of a duck foot as they leave the ground. So that's natural. So basically on the way down, knees are going out and the reversal, they should be taken in a little bit. Um, you can't take in too much. And then on the way down back up. So where you might see a fault or as if you did like a hurdle jump is what you're seeing the knees collapse in too fast, too soon, too hard. Um, that would be an indicator or maybe it's too late. So you should see them there's once you see enough video, you'll start to see there's this point right at the bottom where it's the correct amount of internal rotation. And well, this is the thing too, is people have different amounts of internal rotation. Um, if you go to my Instagram, I posted a video maybe three weeks ago. It was a sprinter from I think Washington state who was like a six, five Oh 60 guy and could bounce over hurdles, like no one's business. And he is more externally rotated. His internal rotated position is knees basically straight ahead. <laughs> Whereas for me, I'm internally rotated. My internal rotated position in a hurdle jump is knees almost hitting each other. Cause I'm starting from that point. So you have to take that in mind that people are different rotations. Uh, to begin with. So the problem you're usually going to get is if it's just, if it's a, an uncontrolled collapse and you don't get back out of it, spring back out of it quickly. Um, it's probably not the best answer in the sense of it's honestly something you kind of have to look at to see. Um, but I will say, uh, we can go to, we can talk about it from foot pressure is an easy one. The feet, Ideally, you should be, if I have my hands here, but when you're doing that jump, you should have full transverse arch pressure, meaning you, the ball of your pinky toe should be pressurized. The ball of your big toe should be pressurized. Um, if you're like only on the inside edge and the, the ball of the pinky is gone, then that could be a problem. Um, the toes out, I don't see a problem with that as long as you're getting pressurization. Um, so as long as you have full access, then that's probably okay. Um, or it could be the toes out could be the body wanting to find pronation. So it's spinning the feet out to try to find pronation and trying to find loading. Cause maybe it didn't get it in the knees. Um, so there's a few reasons why, uh, so I'll just say it's like, it's the timing. So checking the rhythm of external to internal and various jumps. And so I would say for you, like you sh in the first, the before video you showed me, uh, you were, do you were doing a move where your knee was one, your left leg was ahead and your right foot was out to the side. Yeah, I could show you a picture of Kyrie Irving crossing over a defender and his feet are almost in that same position. I think that there's just a subtlety where I think you were maybe there a little too long. And I'm talking like that's not a bad position, but if you looked at the timing of it versus maybe if you did that barefoot, which I don't think, I mean, I, you know, going through the cheese barefoot, I, I, I don't know what you would do before and after with that, but like you might, you may have been like a half inch less. It may not have been like a big difference, but those we will get into those positions. It's just, are you stuck in them and how fast do you get out of it? What's the timing and getting out of it? Are your feet pressurized? And you could also say, um, are you on the end range of your hip rotation? So did I go all the way to the guardrail or do I still have some bandwidth and hip rotation? Uh, I hope that makes sense. I did have a little comment about your barefoot and how I'll, I'll see people run better sprint times barefoot and see those dynamics. I mean, generally you're, you're just more class two because you have better sensation when you're barefoot. So there's that. Yeah. Um, but it's a, it's an answer. Where it's like, I want to, it's how you can't lay down a polarizing statement. You just have to kind of get good at watching, but if the feet are pressurized, you're, you're in a great place with that stuff. Yeah. I mean, when I look at it, what I see is that my foot contacting is looks poor sensitivity. 
right? It's like my foot is is sort of slapping down in the middle of the foot rather than kind of having a more articulated contact starting with the ball of the foot um, or even starting with the heel, depending on the strategy. But in this case, it just sort of looks like it's flopping onto the surface. It doesn't have a high sensitivity to the surface. And then it's immediately, it's very rapidly rolling very far into internal rotation. Whereas um, what I believe you would see now, and especially if I was barefoot, is that I would have a ball of the foot contact and the ball of the foot contact would, would be pressurized much earlier, right? The ball of the foot contact, the ball of the foot would be, would be controlling the pressure against the tree yes. better yeah. rather than feeding it up the chain to the knee to deal with the forces. Right? Yep. So the foot yeah, because, is over. Yeah, because you didn't it pressurize the foot, the most range of motion, the slack had to get taken out somewhere. So it got taken out by probably a faster knee rotating to the center than was optimal. Yeah. And so then the, the I don't think, I'm sure that you'd see some uh, internal rotation in my shin on that particular sort of tick tacking movement or in my, my femur, but I don't think it would be nearly as dramatic at this stage of my uh, training. Okay, so the so it's a time. It's not just where it goes, but it's when it goes and how yes. fast it goes. Yeah, I think that's more of the. I mean, again, this is stuff where like, man, it's like, man, I wish I had three lifetimes to learn all this stuff. You know, yeah. it's it just it's a lot. Um, and that's actually my biggest area probably to study right now is a lot of working the human body as a looking as a pressure system. Uh, what should you have in mid stance, early stance, late stance? Here's the lifts that translate to that. Here's where you see it in the like. That's how I'm continuing to evolve, so I can give you a better answer. Then we'll just pressurize the feet and have adequate range of motion when you're. And we will say too, like if you're squatting, I like what Pat Davidson says is find a tripod and just kind of and don't coach the femurs. Let them do what they're gonna do. Notice the femurs, but don't coach them. And so yeah. just by noticing in a controlled squat situation, you should start to see. Like and having the feet adequately sensing, maybe you're barefoot, maybe the heels are elevated slightly, maybe you have shoes on, but you can at least you're at least wiggling your toes around. You should start to notice what the body will do. And good athletes, like watch Olympic lifters, their knees will go through the bandwidth. They will hit the bottom of their lift, and those knees will tick inwards. It's you can't lift the weight if you don't do that, at least on a high level. You're always going to see that. So it's a, that's a cool area to watch that in action too, and watch the timing there, and just start to get familiar with it. Yeah. When, yeah, it feels like if you're, if you're sort of, if you're internally rotated the whole time, or it's just diving in there to, to get some sense of stability, then that indicates you're missing some, uh, yeah. some other options that you need. Yeah. You set the bandwidth. If you're just jamming internal rotation as your primary strategy, that's not a good thing. Um, it's part of the, it's the internal rotation is ref a reflexive response to adequate foot pressure in the ideal world. You, know, you have good foot pressure and good pressure coming from the top too and range of motion. Very cool. Okay, man, I've kept you much longer than I uh, than we anticipated. Uh, so I think we'll we'll wrap up there. Uh, folks are looking to, uh, to know where to find you on the web, know uh, how to work with you. Uh, where should they go? Oh yeah, um, just flysports.com with dashes. Uh, between the, the words, uh, I've been told that's bad for SEO or whatever, like finding me, but I uh, go just fly sports on Twitter and Instagram. You can find a lot of my stuff and um, some of my video analysis and things like that. Very cool. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. I was watching some of your video analysis this morning, kind of prepping for this conversation. I watched the one you were talking about, the, uh, the 61 inch um, hurdle hops. Very yeah. impressive. Uh, it's, it's great to, to, to see people breaking down movement at that level. And I think whether you're a basketball player, track and field athlete, parkour, um, being able to see more of what's happening. Uh, you know, I think of this as the invisible jujitsu of locomotion, right? Yeah. Um, that's what we're trying to, trying to elucidate much better than just like, let's add strength or have people bounce more. Um, how do we do it? Uh, so awesome. Thank you very much, Joel. And uh, it was a real pleasure speaking with you. Yeah. Thanks for having me on, Ray. Thanks for listening to the Evolve Move Play podcast. If you want to support what we're doing, make sure to like, share, subscribe, and hit that notifications button so you know what's coming up. And of course, the biggest support you can give is to become a Patreon supporter. This is what's going to allow us to grow this platform more than anything else. So this is entirely listener supported, and we really appreciate your support. And we look forward to talking to you again soon.